In a dirty alleyway of the city of Ergastulum, a man beats up a woman for not bringing in enough money. The woman, whose name is Alex, looks up at the sound of a phone ringing coming from the building across the street. In the windows, a man looks curiously at her. That man is Nicholas Brown, and while it's his phone ringing, he doesn't answer it, nor will he ever. Instead, his partner, Warwick Arcangelo, answers. It's a call from one of their clients asking for their services. Nick and Warwick go to Granny Joel to take out the nuisances around her tobacco shop, for it's her who called earlier. She thanks the boys for their service and says she has another job for them. But Warwick says they won't be able to take it since they have an appointment with Inspector Chad Adkins. While they talk, they hear a disgruntled man coming out of a nearby alley, closing his belt buckle as he walks away. Following him is the same woman from earlier, Alex, whose nose is now bloodied. Granny Joel chides the woman to go somewhere else to do her business, as she claims it disrupts hers. Alex simply looks at them before walking away. Warwick notices she's a new face in town and Granny Joel agrees, saying there has been a surge of unfamiliar faces coming and going lately. Warwick looks at Alex with pure male appreciation. Alex doesn't see this, but she feels something soft fall on top of her head. It's a white handkerchief. When she looks up, the men are not there anymore. Meanwhile, in another part of the city, a meeting is about to be concluded. Daniel Monroe, Uranos Corsica and Loretta Cristiano Amodio are there, along with their bodyguards. A fourth chair is empty, indicating there should be another one with them. Together, they are the powerhouses that control the city of Ergastulum. As Corsica stands up, Monroe brings up the topic of a group that's causing trouble around District 7 and asks whether they belong to Corsica's faction. Instead of answering, Corsica puts down a bundle of money and asks him not to make any accusations. Marco, Loretta's right-hand man, also brings out a bundle of money and puts it on the table. It's understood among the three of them that Monroe will be in charge of dealing with the matter. Monroe says he'll take care of the arrangements so it'll be a neutral party who'll take care of it. That neutral party he's referring to is now having their meal at Constance Raveau's gun shop. She's an acquaintance of Nick and Warwick and the granddaughter of Granny Joel. After the quick meal, they proceed to meet Inspector Chad Adkins. He's accompanied by his junior, Cody. Chad tells the pair to take out Barry Abbott and his organisation. He's a pimp whose sphere of activities has increased lately and has been conducting business in the off-limits area. Chad wants them to take out the pimp, his subordinates and all the prostitutes in his organisation. And after that, the police will dispose of the bodies. He offers them the first half of their payment. Warwick looks at the file and sees a picture of Alex. He doesn't like terminating women, so he points out that the police have a protective custody system. But the inspector says they already have enough women and children in their care, they don't need prostitutes to add to their numbers. Nick uses sign language to negotiate and Warwick translates it. He asks if they can take a trophy for themselves. Chad says they can, but warns them not to do anything stupid or else the four fathers will be after their neck. He sends the men off, calling them the handymen for their services. After this meeting, Cody asks his superior about Nick. He initially thinks Nick is a man of few words, but now realises he may have some physical disability. Chad confirms it, saying he may not have good hearing, but he has sharp eyes that can see everything. Indeed, Nick is looking over Barry's headquarters, with the pimp accepting a case full of illegal drugs. Barry Abbott is an ambitious man. He's currently taking orders from Corsica to wreak havoc at District 3, which is Monroe's turf. He plans to take down the Monroe family first, then the Cristianos, then the Corsicas. With the three superpowers gone, Ergastulum will be his. He and his men walk out confidently, not knowing it'll be their last words. Warwick waits for Alex at that alleyway she frequents. Alex knows he and his partner are called the handymen who do odd jobs for a price. She thanks him for the handkerchief, but Warwick says it's Nick's. He asks her why she chose to work for Barry, to which she answers she has nowhere to go. She tells him to leave her, or else Barry might get mad. Warwick walks away with an ominous statement that her pimp will not be around anymore. Alex gets scared and she follows him. Warwick finds Nick almost done with the job, leaving the pimp negotiating for his life. Instead, he shoots him on the knees. The handymen walk to Barry who keeps on offering them his prostitutes and drugs in exchange for his life. Warwick bends down and clarifies that people like him who break the law and scumbags that treat women badly are the type they love the most. To death. And with that, he sends Barry to the afterlife. 
Alex arrives just as Nick is putting the bodies aside. She's in shock at first, before a surge of wrath takes over her body. She picks up a gun and empties its barrel on the pimp's lifeless body. She walks away after that before Warwick follows her. Later, the handymen, together with Alex, meet Chad again for the rest of the payment. At first, Chad is angry about them taking one of the prostitutes in, but Nick kicks the police car to make a point. That even if they're indebted to the police officer, it doesn't mean he can control them. With no choice, Chad allows them to take Alex, saying this is why he hates tags. Alex doesn't know what they're talking about, but she'll learn about them soon. For now, she accepts Warwick's offer of work and temporary shelter. We've now met the central characters of Agastulum, and many others will be introduced as we go along the story. To understand the dynamics between the characters, there are two things to remember. The word tag and the city of Agastulum itself. A few days after the incident, Alex slowly gets used to her role as the unofficial secretary to the handymen. She's also becoming more comfortable living with them, although there are a lot of things about them that she's curious about. When someone knocks on the door, Alex opens it to find a girl who looks startled upon seeing her. Warwick appears and greets the girl as Nina. Wearing only his shorts and with Alex's comfortable clothes, it sends a specific message to anyone who doesn't know their setup, and poor Nina gets shocked about it. She runs away, but she bumps into Nick, who is happy to see her even if he doesn't look like it. Upon clearing the situation, Warwick introduces the girl to Alex. Nina is an assistant to Dr. Theo, the latter being in charge of Nick's and Warwick's health. Alex can see that the girl is close to the two men who saved her. Nina says she's there to ask for help. She says the doctor is involved in some trouble with a tag. She adds that this tag is someone normal people can't easily subdue, probably a B rank or higher. Alex doesn't know what to make of this conversation. What confuses her even more is the medication that Nina hands over to Nick. Nick doesn't look sick at all, so Alex wonders what the medication is for. Warwick tells Nick to go ahead with Nina, he'll follow after taking care of an errand. After the two leave, he asks Alex for a favour. Nick and Nina walk along the streets, unaware that a few men have been looking at the girl. They're about to follow them when Alex distracts them and offers her services. The men refuse, not knowing that they've already fallen for the trap. Warwick comes up behind them and shoots them one by one. Alex shakes at the idea that Warwick simply terminates the men without asking them, but she doesn't hold it against him. Instead, she asks a question. What is a tag? The two start walking towards Dr. Theo's clinic. Warwick answers her question, since he has confirmed that Alex is not a native of Ergastulum. He says he doesn't know how to explain it properly, but tags are a unique breed of people who have enhanced physical abilities. They wear tags that contain their name, affiliation, and their rank, thus the label. Due to their strength, tags tend to be violent and destructive, causing fear and reverence among the normal population. When a tag kills, it becomes a body count for them, and the number of the body count determines the rank. The ranking system consists of a class, starting from D as the weakest, C, B, A, and S as the strongest, and a number starting with five as the weakest, four, three, two, one, and zero as the strongest. Meanwhile, Nick and Nina arrive at the clinic where Dr. Teo is surrounded and intimidated by thugs. Leading them is a tag named Arnold, who is much taller than Nick. Upon seeing the girl with one of the handymen, Arnold rages and punches one of his henchmen. Then he challenges Nick to a brawl. It's customary for a tag to show his badge in a fight, but Nick doesn't show his. As for Dr. Theo, he sees that Arnold is ranked B2 and reflects that he made the right call by calling Nick. He calls Nina to his side, then instructs her to enter the clinic through a rear window and call Inspector Adkins. He can't open the door because he lost his keys. Theo protects his nurse from the thugs who are still trying to capture her. Nick and Arnold start their brawl. Arnold is obviously muscular and physically stronger, but Nick's advantage is in his lightning-fast moves and his small stature compared to his opponent. For Dr. Theo, he knows Nick is simply playing with his prey, but when he almost gets hit by a pipe thrown by Arnold, he threatens Nick with a syringe and orders him to finish the fight. With that, Nick draws out his sword, his signature weapon, and brings out his tag. His rank is a zero. The fight becomes more brutal, but eventually it becomes Arnold's downfall. Nick slashes him across his chest, making him fall in front of Warwick and Alex, who just arrived at the area. After the fight, Chad comes and scolds both Nick and Warwick. 
It's implied that fights between tags must be made known to the police. Due to their volatile behavior, the police must control the situation as soon as possible. Inside the clinic, Nina tries to calm Alex down. She's in shock after witnessing how barbaric a tag can get. She starts to feel scared and she asks Nina if she feels the same. Nina becomes solemn and says Alex may not fully understand the Twilights, but she clarifies that Nick is not scary at all. Dr. Theo hires the handymen to make some deliveries on his behalf and gives them the paper bags labelled with their recipients. And with that, the trio leaves the clinic. Later that night, in an abandoned warehouse, Arnold pleads for a second chance. He's been patched up from his injuries, but at that moment, he's at the mercy of the one who hired him to recruit the doctor. It turns out he planned to kidnap Nina to intimidate Dr. Theo, but it ultimately failed. And now he'll face the consequences of his failure. The last thing he sees are two pairs of maniacal eyes, and the last thing he hears is the slash of a sword. The next day, Warwick wakes up from a nightmare from his childhood. Him, clutching his bloodied left eye, horrified at the scene in front of him. Standing between him and the corpse of his father is Nick. Warwick lies awake on his bed, noting that he dreamt of it again. Outside his room, Alex wakes up as well. She smiles as she looks out the window, remembering the days when she had to loiter around that familiar alley just to get customers. But now, two unconventionally kind men have taken her in and offered her something to do. It's not much, but it's a start. She sees Nick entering the room. He doesn't appear to have seen her, or perhaps he simply doesn't acknowledge any person aside from those close to him. Between the two men, it's Nick whom Alex is a bit wary of. Warwick comes out of his room and tells them he won't come with them to deliver until later, as he needs to do his real job first. He puts money inside Alex's clothes and asks her to buy his usual cigarettes. Confused, Alex has no choice but to come with Nick despite her uneasiness around him. She tries to have some small talk with Nick by asking Warwick's real job, but he doesn't respond. She knows that he's deaf and that he mainly communicates using sign language. When forced, he can talk, albeit in a manner similar to that of a toddler, but he's not insensitive and he doesn't dislike Alex. Eventually, he tells her that Warwick works as a gigolo, which greatly surprises her. Their first stop is someone who is a neighbor to Granny Joel. Nick delivers a case that contains a handgun. While waiting, Alex buys the cigarettes from the old woman. In the newspaper that Granny Joel is reading, she sees the article about the unsolved massacre of the Arcangelo family that happened 22 years ago. After the brutal death of Domenico Arcangelo, his wife and his eldest son, the second son, Wallace Arcangelo, was kidnapped. It was suspected that the crime was carried out by the young mercenary employed by the family. Granny Joel sees the article and remarks how long has passed since then. She remembers the case shocking the world in the middle of the anti-Twilight riots. She implies that the kidnapped son and the young mercenary may have settled in her gastulum and have been staying here since. Then she warns Alex to not stay too long with the handyman, especially with that tag. Soon Nick finishes his delivery there and the pair leaves Granny Joel. They move to the next recipient. While waiting for Nick, Warwick arrives, who is driven there by his lady client. With the three of them, they continue their delivery. This chore is a good activity for Alex to learn more about the city of Ergastulum. Even though it's not explicitly explained in the show, it's important to know the context of the setting where the story happens. Ergastulum is a city full of tags, more commonly known as Twilights. There are also normal people living in the city, but the higher ranked tags mainly inhabit the darker and obscure alleyways. The city is under the control of four mafia families, Corsica, Monroe, Cristiano and Paltley. All four of them maintain the balance within the city. The packages that the trio is delivering contain a medicine known as Celebra. It's a vital medication for the tags, for it keeps their violent tendencies under control. The first family they deliver to is the Cristiano family. Marco and Galahad, two high-rank members of the family, greet them as they accept their medicine. Their next stop is the Monroe family. They happen to witness Daniel Monroe's men, Delico and Yang, executing someone much to Alex's horror. After this rather gruesome encounter, Warwick hands over the medicine to one of Daniel's men. From their conversation, it seems like the head of the Monroe family has a soft spot for the handyman. He offers Nick a job and a place in his ranks and even allows his contract holder to come, referring to Warwick. But Nick coolly declines the offer. 
Their last stop for deliveries is a brothel run by Georgiana, also known as Big Mama. She's a member of the Corsica family. While waiting for her, Alex notices that the women working there are fawning over Warwick. She also notices the disdainful looks they give Nick. It turns out Warwick used to work there when he was young. One of the prostitutes asks Warwick why he's still hanging out with that tag. If he discards him, then he can walk along the roads. Alex protests this, but just then, Warwick pins the prostitute against the wall and warns her to shut her mouth to everyone's surprise. Big Mama appears right at that time. She apologises to the handymen for the way her daughters behaved. She explains that since this brothel is Corsica's tough, the workers share the same negative sentiments against the tags as with the yid of the family. At least Georgiana is polite and still accepts some under her employment. In fact, the medicine that Warwick is delivering is for someone they used to know. And as they leave, Warwick instructs Alex to come home with Nick. Well, when she looks for him, she finds him inside a room looking at a bedridden woman. It isn't stated explicitly in the show, but the woman may have been a tag that used to live with the handyman until her unidentified illness took over her body. Alex reflects, remembering what Granny Joel said earlier. Is it really dangerous to live with someone like Nick? Alex sleeps off the rest of the day until the next morning. She sees Warwick sleeping peacefully in his room. Still troubled by her thoughts, she goes back to the alleyway where she used to hang out. She hums a song before realising that Warwick is walking towards her. He tells her to get out of her gastulum before it's too late. Instead of reacting to this advice, she asks him about when he started working as a gigolo. He recalls he started when he was young, back when Big Mama first recruited him. Alex asks him about the why questions in his life, and Warwick seems to reflect on it as a good question. A few days later, horrifying news breaks all over Agastulum about the discovery of several mutilated bodies in an abandoned warehouse at District 6. The police are still working on identifying the bodies. Chad and Cody have detained Nick and Warwick at the police station. Everyone thinks they have something to do with the warehouse case, but Chad has other ideas in his mind. As Cody painstakingly interrogates a cool Nick, he looks at Warwick and remembers when he first took them in, when they were still teens. He wonders if anything has changed for these two. Chad decides to switch with Cody. He instructs his subordinate to give the files to Warwick and let him scan them while he himself stays with Nick. Warwick gets the book, opens it and starts scanning it at a fast rate. As per Cody, the faces of the bodies are so mutilated that the forensics have a hard time identifying them. But some other bodily marks like tattoos or piercings are still visible. And that's what Warwick uses to recall the faces and identify where he'd seen them before. That will give the police a big break in finding out the motive behind this massacre. After he's done identifying them, he returns the files to a stunned Cody, who asks how he managed to recall all the details. Warwick casually says he's that good at memorising. However, he has always been that way. We see a flashback of a younger Warwick scanning a book and remembering its contents. The flashbacks offer more depth to Warwick's and Nick's characters, as they reveal the truth behind the present situation. We see that Warwick belonged to an affluent family in the past and used to be called Wallace Arcangelo. He had his own tutor who taught him about the origins of the drug Celebra. The drug was created as an enhancer of physical abilities. Soldiers who consumed them maximised their strengths and were deployed in combat. However, it was addictive and toxic when ingested in high dosages. Cases of memory loss and eventual deaths led to its ban. Continuing his lectures about the Celebre, the tutor explains that the descendants of those who used the drugs showed pronounced genetic aftereffects. In exchange for unusually developed physical abilities, they were deficient in mental capacities. In most cases, they require daily doses of Celebra to combat the strong withdrawal effects of the drug. In general, their lifetimes were much shorter than the average, which gave them the label Twilights. When Wallace isn't studying, he spends his time smoking outside the mansion's gate. That's when he met Nicholas Brown for the first time. He's introduced as the son of Gaston Brown, the leader of the Westgate mercenaries. They were employed by his father to protect the family from the worsening anti-Twilight riots. Gaston says Nicholas would be his new bodyguard. Wallace wasn't happy about it. But he wasn't happy in the mansion at all. There were rumours that he was the bastard child of Domenico Arcangelo and it had made his life a misery. Giving him a bodyguard the same age as him, who happened to be deaf and a twilight, wouldn't make things better. But he noticed the scratches Nick gets every day, and was reminded of his own bruises. He softened towards the boy. 
In the present, Chad receives a call from Daniel Monroe, who seems to be in the middle of a gunfight. He calmly demands the help of the handymen to protect him, just as he shoots one of the snipers aiming for his head. Chad has no choice but to let Nick and Warwick go. They run around the city to find Daniel Monroe. At a turn, they discover the sliced, mutilated bodies of Monroe's men. Warwick is stunned to realise that the wounds were cleanly cut, just like the ones found in the warehouse case. He comprehends that the person who's after Monroe might be the same culprit. They continue following the trail of blood. Meanwhile, Delico, one of Monroe's men, has managed to subdue one of the teams that attacked them. Ivan Glaziev, another Monroe subordinate, looks relaxed as the trouble seems to be over. But then, they are approached by a sobbing boy, who turns out to be the one behind the attack. He easily slices the other men with his kukri knives. Ivan runs and hides in an alley, while Delico manages to defend himself from the attack. The boy, or rather the short man, smiles in appreciation. But his target is Daniel Monroe, so he jumps away to look for his prey. Delico immediately calls Yang, who is with their boss along with Miles and Diego. However, it's too late as the man with the kukri knives has already caught up with them. To their horror, he's a twilight, and based on his combat skills, he must be a high-ranking one. While the twilight wreaks havoc on Monroe's men, two henchmen of another family observe the situation. They don't notice that Warwick and Nick have already subdued their comrades, until Warwick shoots one of them. He leaves one alive for interrogation. After tying his hostage, Warwick warns Nick to be careful. The attacker may be the same culprit behind the warehouse case, a fearless being who's ignoring the three laws. Nick only looks at him before walking away. When he's alone, he gulps a large dose of celebre to get ready for the fight. Back on the streets, the twilight runs straight for Monroe. But Delico runs in time to protect his boss, injuring himself in the process and tearing the chain of his tag. Yes, Delico is another twilight whose rank is D0. The twilight taunts Delico, but he senses someone incoming. Just in time, he dodges Nick's sword and sacrifices one of his knives. The Twilight smiles as he finally realises he's facing an equal. He shows his tag, which bears the rank A0, the same one as Nick. A fierce fight ensues between the two Twilights. Delico watches in awe as his boss and other comrades place their bets on who will win. Meanwhile, in another part of the city, a redhead girl runs frantically to her boss. Her name is Ginger, and she urgently needs to talk to Sir Paul Klee. Upon reaching her, Ginger nervously tells about one of their men, whose name is Doug, who has apparently taken a job without approval. When Sir Porkley asks about the job, Ginger says it's about taking Monroe's head, which greatly surprises her. Nick and Doug continue to fight. Each one of them is on par with the other, which makes it an entertaining spectacle for those who watch. Monroe recalls a time when a low-rank Twilight attacked the headquarters. He was a young boy with a C3 rank, Monroe still finds it funny that the C3 Twilight managed to wreak havoc at his headquarters for a petty reason. Before Monroe can continue his story, Warwick walks to them and supplies the rest of the details. Apparently, the C3 Twilight was out to get revenge for his friend. Everyone greets Warwick and the latter informs them of what he's found out from his hostage earlier. He reveals they're working for the Corsica family and they hired Doug to go after Monroe's head. This is unbelievable as the Corsicans are known to hate Twilights. Warwick explains they were new recruits and wanted to set themselves apart from the rest of the family. They look back at the two tags who are now fighting on top of the roofs. Each attack is getting more vicious with each strike aiming to land a fatal blow. Eventually, Doug manages to throw four knives towards Nick, which the latter wards off with his arms. Taking advantage of his opponent's distraction, Doug jumps towards Monroe. Delico runs to cover his boss with his body. Before Doug can strike with his kukri, Nick jumps on him and then tosses him inside a window while he lands on a pile of garbage bags. Doug immediately escapes before he can be caught. Warwick walks to Nick, who doesn't seem to be phased about his injuries or his surroundings. Warwick realises that Nick may have overdosed on Celebre, enhancing his physical resilience and suppressing his pain receptors. Nick jumps back to the rooftops to go after Doug. He needs to end the fight before the Celebre wears off. Warwick sighs in resignation. He requests Miles to contact the Porkley Guild, as it happens that Doug is a Twilight affiliated with them. The fight must stop. If Nick manages to finish Doug, it will spell trouble for all of them. He also asks Monroe to move on and leave everything to him. Before leaving, Monroe clarifies his story. 
The C3 Twilight who retaliated on his family did not say he was doing it for a friend, but rather for his contract holder. Warwick smiles and says he considers Nick as a friend, whether the latter does or not. Delico realizes that the Twilight his boss was referring to earlier was Nicholas Brown. This implies that Nick and Warwick may be sharing a more technical relationship than being friends. Once alone, he follows the two Twilights who are still fighting. He must stop them before Porkley arrives. However, it's too late. Nick corners Doug, who is now feeling fatigued after all the fighting. He recognizes that his opponent may have overdosed on medication. He attempts to stop him, but Nick won't listen. Nick swings his sword, destroying Doug's last cookery. He swings it again for the final blow, but his prey suddenly goes missing. Ginger has arrived just in the nick of time and saves Doug from going to the afterlife. Carrying the small man, Ginger looks at Nick and stutters her words about stopping the fight. Nick won't listen though. He walks towards them and this time he's stopped by Warwick. He struggles and Warwick is forced to say it's an order. Walking towards them is a strong, muscular woman with striking features. She's Sir Gina Paltley, the head of the Paltley Guild and one of the forefathers of Ergastulum. She recites the three laws for Twilights, which state the following. Do not take action against normals, obey your masters, defend yourself. The laws were put in place by the forefathers to release Twilights from slavery. And yet Doug dares to break them. The Paltley Guild is in charge of managing the Twilights in the city, therefore, it's up to them to employ sanctions on those who break the laws. She brings out a pistol and shoots a celebra bullet onto Doug. She reiterates that Monroe is under the protection of the three laws and his demise will mean the loss of balance in Ergastulum. Gina also shoots Nick with the celebra bullet. This makes Warwick nervous. He reaches for his gun, but Ginger quickly pulls it out of its holster and points it at him. Her whole demeanor has changed from super shy to super dangerous. Gina assures Warwick she's only there to sanction the Twilights. She walks towards Nick and picks him up. Nick seems to have greatly weakened, which suggests that Gina has used a type of celebra known as a downer. She reminds him to not overdose on his medication, especially on the stimulant variant known as the upper. She tells him it's fine doing it for himself, but she can't have him upsetting his contract holder. And with that, he shoots three more bullets into him. Once the Porkley members leave, Warwick has no choice but to bring the two Twilights to Dr. Theo's clinic. Nina has just finished attending to a patient when Warwick arrives dragging Nick and Doug with him. Nina immediately attends to them. Since the bullets used are actually glass syringes that contain the liquid medication, it's easy for her to treat her patients. After the events of the attack, Daniel Monroe orders his men to gather the bodies of those who perished earlier. He asks Delico about his injuries. Delico says he doesn't need to go to Dr. Theo, so he has asked Young to patch him up. Monroe, in an avuncular manner, tells Delico he needs to be his impenetrable shield so he can live a longer life. Delico can't do it if he doesn't take care of his wounds the proper way. And with that, he dismisses the two men. Then he contemplates the information Warwick shared earlier. If it's true that Corsica has a hand in the attacks, then it will lead to an all-out war. Monroe recognises this possibility, in the same way he recognises Ergastulum as a city where a war would be inevitable. In another part of the city, Ivan talks to a man hidden in the shadows. From their conversations, it seems like Ivan is a mole sent by another family to spy on Monroe and to help in terminating him. Ivan admits he didn't expect the twilight and he was almost killed earlier. It was lucky then that he managed to get away. As for the bodies in the warehouse, the other man in the shadows worries that the inspector may connect the case to him. But Ivan assures him that won't happen as he has his own mole in the police department to interfere with the investigation. It looks like trouble is brewing in Ergastulum at a fast rate. Soon, the power balance may be disrupted before anyone realises what is happening. In another set of flashbacks, we see more details on how Nick and Warwick developed their friendship and the similar dilemmas they shared about their respective fathers. Gaston gives Nick a celebra tablet. One of the mercenaries commented on how obedient Nick was, to which Gaston replied, He's a twilight, which left him no choice. It was evident that Gaston didn't care much about his son, and it can be implied that he was physically abusing him as well. He also revealed that he terminated Nick's mother. Meanwhile, Wallace had decided to teach Nick how to read or write. He spotted some bruising on Nick's arm and asked how he got it. Nick answered, he fell. Wallace looked melancholic as he shared his frequent falling as well. 
They were disturbed by a noise coming from the garden. It looked like some intruders had infiltrated the garden. Wallace overheard his father issuing orders to keep his family safe except for him. A sound by the window made him turn around. To his surprise, Nick had jumped off the window, which was three stories tall, and into the lawn, where he managed to kill the intruder. Later, Domenico reprimands Gaston and his son for staining his garden with blood. Then, after drinking too much alcohol, he turned his anger toward Wallace and accused him of plotting to kill him. Young Wallace denied everything, but his father wouldn't lend him an ear. Domenico smashed a wine bottle near his son's head and left him to his weeping. It's safe to say that both Nick and Warwick experienced abuse from their respective fathers at a young age. Their situation as a master and bodyguard had made them close to each other and relate in a way that no one else can. In the present, Nick's condition has stabilised thanks to Nina's ministrations. Warwick expresses his relief, then informs him that he'll go back to their office to check on Alex. Before leaving, he says two things to Nick. First, he shouldn't make him say the word order as it doesn't sit right with him. Second, he reveals that Corsica plans to upset the balance in Ergastulum. His next target is the Cristiano family. He also shares his discovery about the bodies found in the warehouse case. They were all Twilights, including Arnold, whom Nick fought with earlier. Somebody is targeting the Twilights, and it's not yet clear whether Corsica is directly involved. Whatever the case, it's clear that Monroe is the target, the vital figure in the pro-Twilight movement. The Cristiano family is closely tied to him and an attack on them will mean an attack on the Monroe family. Warwick says he owes Monroe a lot, so he promises to do his best to protect the family. All wants is assurance from Nick to stick up with him. After Warwick leaves, Nick sits up and thinks about what his partner said. He ruefully smiles as he accepts his fate as a twilight. Warwick walks back to the office. He's been worrying about Alex, who hasn't answered his calls for the day. To his surprise, instead of Alex, he finds Dr. Theo there. As it turns out, while they are fighting Doug, Alex is having hallucinations about Barry coming back to life. The doctor says it's one of the withdrawal symptoms from the TB pills she used to take. Apparently, Barry made her take those pills so he could keep her and other prostitutes under his control. And now, Alex is suffering by showing brutal symptoms of her withdrawal. Warwick runs out to look for her. He finds her in the alleyway. Alex attempts to seduce him, which means she's still experiencing hallucinations. He headbutts her, causing both of them great pain in their heads. But this is effective, as Alex wakes up and apologises for her behaviour. Warwick assures her it's alright and jokes about having his worst day become better by touching her derriere. Alex pretends to scold him, but she's grateful for being saved by him. We continue the tale of the handymen Nicholas Brown and Warwick Arcangelo, and the brewing trouble that is bound to shake the city of Ergastulum, Warwick continues to have nightmares about his childhood, specifically around the time when he was learning about Nick's condition as a twilight. Since the stigma of having short lifespans was unshakable, it was no wonder that doctors didn't hold any hope for curing them. Warwick was adamant at that time that Nick should be attended to and refused to believe nothing could be done. When Warwick wakes up, he's surprised to do so in the arms of Alex. She's heard his whimpers and has thought she may be able to comfort him. He's grateful for her presence, although he's still shaken by his dreams. He remembers her asking him about his whys, the reasons for living in such a manner. He tells her no answer had come to him when he asked the same question as a child. Even now, it still eludes him. Meanwhile, back at Dr. Theo's clinic, Nick is up and about, along with Doug. Nina is glad that both of her patients have made full recovery from their fighting days ago. Doug finds out that Nick is deaf, as a sort of compensation for being physically strong as a twilight, and that he's from the West Gate, an outsider just like him. As for Doug, his compensation is his stunted growth. He's actually 21 years old and originates from South Gate. Inspector Chad Adkins arrives, interrupting their conversation. Chad informs Doug that the Porkley Guild will be grounding him for his actions. He offers to drive the twilight back home, but before that, he talks to Dr. Theo first about the autopsies he made on the corpses involved in the warehouse case. While Nick and Nina are playing, jumping from roof to roof, the doctor tells the inspector about the important findings of the autopsy. He confirms that all victims were twilights. He posits the following. All victims were at the prime of their lives. Lack of defensive wounds meant the victims were restrained against their will. 
and the mutilations happened while they were still alive. Distressed, the inspector says it'll be hard to identify them all without their tags, but Warwick has immensely helped in taking the first step. He's afraid that the warehouse case and the attack on Daniel Monroe the other day will be the precursor to another anti-Twilight's riots, similar to what happened years ago. Speaking of the attack, the forefathers of Agastulum gather together to discuss it. In attendance are Daniel Monroe, Uranus Corsica, Loretta Cristiano Amodio and Gina Paulkley. Loretta accuses Corsica of masterminding the attack and hiring a Twilight. It's well known among them and the whole city that Corsica is not a fan of Twilights. He hates them with a passion, but Corsica adamantly denies this. Conspiring with Twilights? He'd rather crawl in sewage than have his name associated with those monsters. Monroe calms everyone down. He seems relaxed, even after the unsuccessful attempt on his life. He is thinking about something, and he shares it with others. With the recent warehouse case, the rising numbers of Twilight's victims and the attack on his life, it's safe to assume that some forces outside Ergastulum are involved. As for the reason, there's no definitive answer, but it seems like someone is trying to destroy the balance in the city. This announcement causes ominous feelings among the other fathers. Back at the clinic, Alex visits Dr. Theo for a follow-up checkup. She's remorseful about the scratches she gave the doctor during her episode of withdrawal, but the doctor waves it, saying it's only natural. He prescribes her medication in case the symptoms get stronger. When Alex offers to give back something in return for his kindness, Dr. Theo says that making candy for Nina will be payment enough. And with that, she and Nick leave. Alex, using sign language, expresses her gratitude to Nick for taking her in. But she asks if she can stay longer while she looks for a new residence. In response, Nick tells her to improve her sign language. She can learn more from the book that he used before to learn, the same book that Warwick gave him when they were young. He remembers that it was him who encouraged him to read and write. Back then, Warwick was known as Wallace, and Nick was assigned to be his bodyguard. It was around the time when the anti-Twilight's riots were getting intense, and the mercenaries hired by Wallace's family were hard at work protecting them. He got sick one time and had to stay in to recover. When he did, he found out Wallace had bought him from his father. It might be for his benefit, as his father was abusive to him. He was catatonic when he learned about it. Wallace's father was no better. He treated his son poorly just because he's a bastard child. The turning point was when his father caught him smoking. He beat him so badly and decided to put out the cigarette on his eye. Wallace looked by the door to see Nick watching. He mouthed something, but the pain from the cigarette made him forget everything else. The next thing he knew, his father was lying on the ground, bloody and lifeless. His mother and half-brother were next. When Nick attempted to end his life, he stopped him. He was angry about everything. He wouldn't let Nick get away. He owes him. The memory of his family's massacre comes back to Warwick, making his blind eye tingle. Delico approaches him. They talk about the recent attacks on Twilights. Delico warns him about Nick's safety. After all, Warwick is Nick's contract holder. Warwick pretends to be nonchalant about it. But in truth, he does worry about him. He's his friend, no matter what anyone thinks about them. Perhaps Warwick should take Delico's warning seriously. The real perpetrators behind the attacks are on the move again. Erica and Mikhail have just eliminated their latest victims and are on their way to find more. In a chance encounter, Erica walks by Nick and Alex. Alex doesn't notice, but Nick's animal instincts tell him that he'll be in for a terrific and brutal treat in the coming days. Attacks on Twilights continue the next day. Even the normals, common people who don't depend on Celebre, have joined the fray. Their works are more crude than the perpetrators who cleanly cut their prey. Chad and his junior Cody can only collect bodies and pile them in the morgue. On the other side of the city, the handymen, together with Alex, come and repair Constance's shop. Since she runs a gun shop, it's not surprising that hot-headed customers can lose their control. Warwick informs Alex that they'll be attending the soiree hosted by the Cristiano family that night. Before she can react or ask about it, Constance invites her inside to have some tea. While the two women talk, the two men outside also have their conversation. Nick inquires how much they are charging the Cristianos for their service that night, and Warwick names an amount that's about lower than Nick expects. Warwick says the Cristianos are not as well off as the other families, despite being one of the fathers of the city. They also discuss what Monroe told Warwick the day he was attacked. When Monroe said that Nick referred to Warwick as his contract holder, 
In technical terms, it's true since he bought Nick from his father. However, Warwick doesn't like the term and prefers to call their relationship partners or even friends. Granny Joel arrives at that point to supervise the repairs on her granddaughter's shop. When she enters, she's surprised to see Alex. After her warning before, she expects the girl to have left the handymen. Constance learns that Alex used to be a prostitute, but Granny Joel sagely says she'll return to it soon. Constance assures Alex that her grandmother doesn't mean anything by that remark. Then she asks her if she has plans to go back to her family. It's as if something snaps inside Alex. She suddenly sees images of a young boy in her head. Alex realises she has a younger brother. The more she remembers, the more the hallucination of Barry hovering over her becomes stronger. Despite shaking, she recognises that it's another attack of her symptoms. She reaches for her medication, but she finds it hard to open it. Thankfully, Nick is there to do it for her. She calms down and inhales gratefully for the support. When the repairs are done, Granny Joel invites them in to eat some snacks. Constance pulls Nick inside, leaving Warwick and Alex. After a few beats, Warwick starts by apologising for not looking after her. Alex says it's OK and relays the memory of her younger brother finally coming back to her. He assures her that the memories suppressed by the TB pill will come back sooner or later. Later that night, they attend the soiree. Warwick and Alex enter a club called Bastard, an establishment owned by the Cristiano family. He brings flowers for Loretta, who notices Alex and calls her by her full name, Alex Benedetto. Warwick introduces the girl as the head of the family. Alex is surprised. She doesn't expect a small girl to be heading such an influential family. Marco Adriano steps in and explains some important things to her. Loretta has taken over her father's position after he passed away. Despite her age, she's intelligent enough to understand the role of her family, as well as the roles of others, in balancing the powers in Ergastulum. The Porkley Guild dispatches mercenary twilights for each family's protection. The Cristiano family provides supply routes for Celebrare inside the city. The Monroe family deals with commerce and provides business opportunities for twilights not associated with the Porkley Guild, while the Corsica family handles weapons and vices. After that brief lesson, Marco, along with Galahad Woa, takes pleasure in introducing themselves to Alex. Alex is flustered, but Loretta isn't having any of it. She playfully kicks Galahad on the shins. Warwick joins in on the joke and charges Galahad a hundred bucks for peeking, which earns him a slap from Alex. These kinds of interactions are so ordinary and feel wholesome no one would even think that disturbances are already happening within the vicinity. Nick is on the rooftop, looking over the commotion happening on the streets. Many people are running, either to get away or to chase. Warwick walks up to him and comments about their job. Even if the Cristianos won't pay them a hefty sum for their service, at least they get a hot meal for it. Their job for that night is to direct all the targeted twilights into the club. In response to the recent attacks, Loretta has decided to host a soiree to at least provide shelter for the Twilights. And the handymen are the better candidates to help ensure that nothing will go awry. Nick and Warwick set to work, and they start by saving a group of tags hunted by the normals. Left in the club, Alex muses how the night seems so peaceful. She reflects that it's been so long since she experienced something like this, and she rarely gets to appreciate such moments. Looking relaxed, she hums a tune that Galahad overhears, but not all good things last. She hears a gunshot not so far from the club. She's about to call for help when Galahad stops her. He orders her to feign ignorance, then points at the windows of the building across them. Silhouettes of men stand there, seemingly watching. Galahad explains that the family has been under constant surveillance from the government, and due to this, they can't be seen directly helping the Twilights. They can only depend on the handymen to do the job, but even with their expertise, they can only do so much. Galahad also directs Alex to look at the dance floor. That's when she realises most of the patrons were twilights, and the club is offering a refuge in a discreet way. To distract her, Galahad announces to everyone that Alex will be offering them a performance. She's reluctant at first, but with encouragement from Loretta and the audience, Alex gives in. She sings blues that capture her audience. Alex doesn't aim to be a singer, but she has a voice that soothes one's soul. She sings, remembering the time she used to sing this as a lullaby to her younger brother. 
Outside the club, a man wearing a hoodie hears the melody and attempts to come inside. The melody brings him recollections from when he was young and his older sister used to sing it to calm him. But the bouncers won't let him in without an invitation. Somewhere nearby, Nick and Warwick are hard at work defending the Twilights from their hunters. These tagged people are low ranked, of D class and number five. They don't differ that much from the normals and yet the discrimination against them is too high and dangerous. After ensuring that the normals have been subdued, the handymen lead them to the club. One of them, a mother holding her infant child, looks back in uncertainty. Warwick sends her a wink and a salute as a reassurance. When Alex's performance ends, everyone cheers for her. It's her first time performing in front of a crowd, and she feels humbled knowing the people appreciate her song. Loretta approaches her and congratulates her on a well-done performance. She offers her a job to be a songstress in her club. Loretta says she reminds her of her late mother, who was also a prostitute before marrying her father and becoming a singer in the club. Their conversation is cut when someone informs Loretta about the arrival of Ivan Glatziel from the Monroe family. As she walks towards Ivan, she doesn't see a twilight look ominously at her. The man remembers that he's there not to enjoy the peaceful refuge, but to save his daughter from slaughter. Ivan is there to deliver the promised money to Loretta. After the transaction, Ivan walks over to the twilight and discreetly shows him a cut ear. The morbid item seems to agitate the man, who suddenly stands up and cuts the person near him. Then he goes for Loretta, but Galahad punches him. Four more twilights come after the girl. Marco swings down and subdues them. The Cristiano family is perplexed. Why would a twilight attack someone who is taking them in? Loretta walks over to the man who started the trouble. She still shows compassion towards him, and in return she asks to know who is the mastermind behind all the attacks. The man, too afraid to speak, chooses to run away, but not before Mikhail gets his claws on him. Literally, the young boy is part of the duo who are the perpetrators behind the recent twilight killings. The bloodlust shown by Mikhail causes panic among the club's patrons and everyone runs for their lives. Someone pushes Loretta, and she would have landed on broken glass had it not been for Alex catching her. In the chaos, no one sees Ivan calmly walking out of the club. He meets Erica, the other member of the duo, outside, and gives her an order. Kill them all. Nick and Warwick are talking about going back to the club when Nick's nose perks up and suddenly he's on a hunt. Warwick follows, and in doing so, he meets a woman running away from something. That's when he learns that the club is under attack. The woman is in disbelief to have witnessed a boy terminate all the twilights and collect their tags like nothing. It dawns on Warwick that the attackers on the club may be the same ones responsible for the warehouse case. He instructs Nick to go ahead and buy him some time. With a devilish smile, Nick agrees. In the club, Loretta and Alex are in the hallway of the exit route. The girl gives Alex a loaded gun and instructs her to leave, before she herself runs back inside to help her men. Alex is frightened, especially when she starts seeing visions of her younger brother running after Loretta. Instead of succumbing to her fears and her symptoms, Alex follows her. The club is now empty except for Marco and Galahad fighting Mikhail. He's only a boy, but he proves to be a worthy adversary for these men. They have recovered the tags Mikhail has taken from his victims, which infuriates the boy and makes them his target instead. At one point, the two manage to trap him using Marco's wires. But Mikhail's partner, Erica, comes in time to free him. The fight becomes two versus two. But the Cristianos are greatly overwhelmed by Erica's speed. She cuts Marco's necklace, which holds a ring that's important to him. Mikhail goes after Galahad and easily subdues him. Then he goes after Marco, who is also down on the floor. The boy would have mutilated Marco with a broken bottle if not for Loretta shooting at him. Erica parries the bullets with her sword and jumps up to the second floor where Loretta is. But Alex comes in time to shoot her bullets at the perpetrator, making her Erica's next target. Just as she's about to slice Alex's neck, Nick comes and holds her down. Nick is surprised once he's gotten a good look at the woman. Erica, with her blonde hair, ice blue eyes and cold demeanor, is the spitting image of Delico. Nick recognizes her to be Delico's younger sister who has been missing for many years. In a few moves, he assesses that Erica has gained high-level skills as an assassin. Nick smiles, as he thinks this should be an interesting fight to buy some time. Meanwhile, Warwick is climbing up the stairs to the rooftop. If his hunch is correct that the attackers at the club are the same ones responsible for the Twilight killings, 
then he needs to call for help. He shoots a flare gun, which immediately lights up the sky. Every important character in the city sees the signal, and those needed for backup rush to his aid. After that, Warwick goes straight to the club, where he sees the bodies of both Twilights and guards scattered on the ground. There's no doubt about it now. He looks up the window and sees Nick fighting one of the attackers. He too recognises Erica. Inside, she manages to stab Nick. Thankfully, Ginger and Doug arrive, with Ginger easily pinning Erica to the ground. Outside, Inspector Adkins instructs his men to seal off all possible exits. Erica knows they're cornered and she senses that Ginger isn't someone to take on lightly. Knowing that they've done what they can, she and Mikhail escape through the window. Later, she meets with Ivan, enjoying his light touch on her hair. Ivan is talking to Corsica and updates him on what has happened. Satisfied with the report, Corsica ends the call and faces individuals whom he calls the Esminets. Among them is the young man from earlier, who tried to get into the club upon hearing Alex's singing. It turns out he's Emilio Benedetto, Alex's younger brother. The next morning, the attack on the Cristiano family's club becomes the breaking news. Emilio sits on the rooftop along with his comrades. They smile as they listen to the news, knowing they're about to bring chaos to the city soon. Nick, Alex, Galahad and Marco visit Dr. Theo to treat their injuries. The doctor isn't at all thrilled to find out that Nick overdosed on his medication again. He shows a certain brutality towards him that has got Alex concerned. She asks Nina about the doctor. The young nurse explains that it's only the doctor's way to show concern. Dr. Theo is the only physician in the city and he cares for the Twilights very much. He creates his own formulation of Celebra using ingredients from the black market and sells them at a low price for the poor Twilights in the city. The government approved medication is just too expensive. So many people rely on the doctor. One can say he's gained respect from these people who are already destined to suffer in life. Alex absorbs all the information. Being an outsider, almost everything is new to her. She's only learning about Twilights, the forefathers of the city, and the way of living there. She also just finds out that Marco is actually engaged to Constance. If the latter hadn't come to the clinic to check on her fiancé, Alex wouldn't have known. Later, the two women meet, and Constance gives Alex a key. She doesn't explicitly say what it opens, but one may presume it's a key to an apartment. She warns Alex that things will be more complicated later on, and it'll be better if she gets out of the city soon. Meanwhile, Warwick is in the morgue near the police station. He's helping identify the Twilights whose tags were taken by Erica and Mikhail. Chad and Cody watch him through a two-way mirror. Cody is curious about Warwick's ability to remember things exactly. Chad says it's called hypothymesia, a supermemory syndrome. He points out that this is the reason Warwick can be both an asset and a liability, if he ever allies himself with one of the families. Not to mention his partnership with Nick, whom Chad considers a walking murder machine. After helping the police, Warwick goes to the Monroe mansion to discuss Erica. No one has expected her to be alive. Not even Delico, who is keeping quiet about this shocking discovery. He remembers the day when he thought he had lost his sister. Back then, Nick and Warwick used to be part of the Monroe family. They were there to rescue the victims of the attack on the institution that housed many Twilight children. Chad was also there issuing instructions to his men. Warwick picked up a younger Yang, who said the attack was too fast and that many children were taken, including Erica. Not far from them was Nick, who was looking over young Delico. The kid was holding a bunny toy that used to belong to his sister. In the present, Delico can only close his eyes as the grave implication of Erica's presence looms over them. After this visit, Warwick goes home. Looking at him walk away is Daniel Monroe. He thinks it's time to go. Behind him is Ivan, who seems to be waiting for him. It's implied that Daniel knows who Ivan really is and who he's working for. Perhaps for the sake of his family, he's keeping quiet about all these. When Warwick comes home, he finds Alex cradling a baby. As it happens, Loretta has decided to stay at the Handymen for her protection, and she took the baby with her. It was the same baby carried by the mother mentioned earlier, who unfortunately perished in the attack last night. Warwick tells Alex that he needs to do something, therefore he must go. He's confident that Nick will be enough to protect both Alex and Loretta. With that said, he leaves. As he walks along the street, he bumps into an unfamiliar man. The man has silver hair and a tribal tattoo on his arm. 
Warwick gets a foreboding feeling from him, but he doesn't make a move until he's sure. Of course, he's right on mark because the man he bumped into is known as Stryker, one of the Esmonets, and his comrades are already wreaking havoc on their target. Housen of the Portly Guild calls Galahad to check on the club's cleanup progress. So far, everything's going smoothly. Housen tells him he's going to send Doug for reinforcements, but their call gets cut. Galahad doesn't think much of it and decides to come to the Guild himself to visit his friends, but he's not yet aware that the Guild is already under attack. Housen receives a report about an intrusion in one of their territories. A young woman seems to be the perpetrator. In addition, all of their lines have been cut. His instincts tell him this is no ordinary incident, so he calls those available to prepare the armory and expect an imminent attack. As for Doug, he still sends him out with two escorts to check the situation. Little does he know the same woman from earlier, whose name is Sig, is already waiting to ambush them. She easily takes out the escorts before her companion Colt comes after Doug and slashes him on the chest. Without warning, explosions shake the city of Agastulum. More than the explosions, the people are shocked that the explosions happened around the area of the Palkley Guild, one of the strongholds of the Four Fathers, and the main institutions that control the Twilights. Common folks know how insanely strong the tagged people are, so knowing that someone courageously attacked the Guild means an act of war. Hausen remains calm, despite the fact that half of the guards have fallen into the hands of Sig, their attacker. He goes to Gina Palkley's quarters and reports about the situation. They have identified three perpetrators, but the smoke from explosions cleverly masks their smell. Based on the skills and finesses shown in terminating the Twilights, there's no doubt that they are hunters. Gina has just gotten up while Ginger is still dressing. She opens a huge metal sliding door on one wall, and from there she can see the carnage of her men and Sig, who's been waiting to see her. As a greeting, she calls Gina a filthy old hag. Out of nowhere, Colt attacks Gina. Ginger easily breaks Colt's knife while Gina remains cool and indifferent. Gina asks another of her men, Triss, for the accounting report. Triss says he'll prepare the repair estimates by tomorrow. Sighing, Gina decides to sleep it off, as if this is just another day of twilight carnage. Sig protests, but one look from Gina shuts her, and even Colt, up. Suffice it to say that more than Ginger, Gina is that person they shouldn't mess with. Gina says that killing 50 or 100 of her men doesn't make her feel any different. She turns her back on Sig and instructs Hausen to take care of them. Sig wants to attack, but Emilio stops her by blowing up the roof near her. He reminds her it's too soon to attack. Reluctantly, Sig and Colt leave, but not before Hausen asks them who they are. It's Colt who tells them that their group is called Traity Esminets, and they work for Uranos Corsica. Now this information affects Gina, Clueless about what's happening, Alex remains at the handyman's office reading more materials about Twilights. Loretta comes out of the room preparing to leave. She intends to go back to her club, but before that, she ensures that someone will take care of the baby she brought there last night. Thankfully, someone offers to foster the baby, which makes Alex happy. She mistakenly calls the baby Emilio, which triggers another episode of her symptom withdrawal. This time, she remembers her brother's name. She feels weak and disoriented. Loretta has no choice but to leave her sleeping in bed and go back to her place. Along the streets, the people are still looking at the smoke coming out of the targeted buildings. Among them is Granny Joel. Galahad walks into them and sees the numerous bodies piling on the sidewalks. He ran as fast as he could when he first heard the explosions, but all he could do was warn the normals to never get involved with a twilight. He instructs Granny Joel to go somewhere safe. Galahad continues to walk towards the guild, when along the way he meets Doug. Doug has stubbornly clung to his life even after a major blood loss due to the cuts on his chest. He wants to find someone he can trust with the information about the attackers, and when he sees Galahad, he feels relieved. He collapses into the big man's arms and offers him his tag. Galahad assures him that he and the others will be right behind him soon, and with that, Doug breathes his last. In Monroe's headquarters, Delico decides to look for his sister. After learning from Warwick that she's alive, he hopes to reunite with her and save her from any possible brainwashing that may have happened to her. Young comes with him, and sending them off from the gate are Diego and Miles. They empathise with his need to find his sister. They walk along the streets of the city, where they hear the explosions. But they continue their search. 
They get a big break when a small girl recklessly attacks Delico, mistaking him for Erica. Delico captures the girl, whose name is Heather, and gently asks her for any information she knows. Thankfully, Heather knows something. She saw Erica kill her sister. She followed her to avenge her sister. With that information, Heather leads Delico and Yang. In another part of the city, Marco secures a crate of weapons from his fiancée, Constance. They share a kiss before separating, with Marco going back to the club and Constance to her grandmother's tobacco shop. Upon arriving there, Constance sees a customer waiting. Had she known that this customer was Beretta, one of the Esmonets, she would have run away. But then, knowing the Esmonets, it's doubtful that Constance would have gotten one step away. Beretta buys a pack of cigarettes, but when she gets a whiff of Constance's scent, she immediately knows who she is. There's a sick look in her eyes as she grabs Constance's wrists and tells her she smells like that old man she once knew. After that, it's anybody's guess what happened to Constance. In the club, one of the staff receives a call about the attack on the guild and the confirmation that they were hunters. Marco gets agitated upon knowing who they are. He immediately asks if one of them is a tall man with silver hair and a tribal tattoo. But the staff says the descriptions are that of a young woman and a young man. Marco runs out of the club and into Granny Joel's shop, where Constance should be. But the shop is empty. Fearing for the worst case scenario, he goes back to the club. Rain has fallen on the city, quelling any possible fires that the rain may have caused. The Esmonets have retreated, but they've done what they came for. They have shaken the powers of Ergastulum. Alex wakes up, groggy from her withdrawal episode earlier. Beside her is Nick. Alex looks at him and says he's familiar. Another memory, albeit blurry, came to her while she was asleep. She saw Nick's silhouette saving her before. Perhaps that's the reason why she stayed near the handyman's office before, why she would often look up at their window. But Nick never acknowledges that. A knock on the door prompts him to stand and open it. They are Loretta's men, asking Nick if he can stand as her bodyguard. Galahad still hasn't returned from the club, and Marco is still feeling down after his fiancé's disappearance. Nick agrees, but he instructs Alex to stay at the office. It's probably the safest place in Ergastulum after the recent incidents. Reluctantly, Alex stays. Granny Joel has heard of what happened to her granddaughter. Fuming with anger, she goes to the club, finds Marco and hits him with her cane. She says something interesting while doing so. She asks Marco if he also plans to take Constance, just like how he took her parents from her. She asks if the Esmonets won't ever stop causing suffering to people. From her questions, it can be said that Marco has a prior connection with the Esmonets. Granny Joel only stops beating him when Nick arrives and grabs her cane. The old woman walks out in the rain, but she knows Nick has followed her. Feeling desperate, she tells Nick it doesn't matter whether it's Constance's head or her finger that returns, as long as she returns. Nick simply keeps his silence. In the Monroe headquarters, Warwick finally arrives there. Miles welcomes him and together they discuss the recent events. They know that the guild has been attacked by a group called Treti Esminets. From their conversation, we learn that this terrorist group has existed before. Their name, Treti Esminets, is Russian for Third Destroyers, which implies that it's the third revival of a group that is far stronger than the Twilights. At the same time, in the club, Marco also reminisces about his time when he was still a hunter and used to belong to Viteroy Esminets, or Second Destroyers. He describes the hunters as superhumans. Their only difference from Twilights is that they don't have any dependence on Celebra, which allows them more freedom. Marco says that even among the hunters, one of them is crazily strong, and his name is Stryker. He believes Stryker may have something to do with Constance's disappearance. If not him, then it's surely one of his former colleagues. And the reason is to pay him back for leaving them before. Speaking of Stryker, he's already at the Monroe headquarters. He declares he wants to see Old Man Monroe. Warwick and Miles see him. They run into the boss's office only to find it empty. Miles says he may be with Ivan. But when Warwick says he doesn't know Ivan, suspicions start to rise. Only then do they realize that this Ivan is a mole planted in their organization. And if the boss is with him, it may be too late. But Miles expresses his fate that the boss is still alive. Armed with this conviction, they brace themselves to face Stryker. Stryker walks through the mansion's corridors like he's walking in a park. When he gets in front of a door, he opens it, only to find Miles sitting behind a desk. 
This is a perfect setup for Warwick to ambush him, along with the simple booby trap he set by the door. But Stryker is not to be underestimated. He easily overpowers Warwick and Miles. When Stryker holds Warwick by his neck, Miles takes the chance to stab Stryker from behind. He kicks him and stabs Warwick using the knife. It's too late when he realizes Warwick has injected him with a downer, a depressant type of Celebra. Enraged, he throws him through the window. It's unclear what happens next to the citizens of Ergastulum. The Esminets are still walking free, as well as Erika and Mikhail. In fact, Erika reminds Mikhail that it's time and both of them leave the warehouse that they use as their hideout. As fate would have it, Heather has led Delico and Yang to District 6, where she last saw Erica. When he looks up, Delico finally sees his sister jumping from one roof to another. In another place in the city, Monroe gives one last sorrowful look over a gastulum, before following Ivan into a tunnel. It's unknown what he plans in his mind and there's no indication if he'll get out of there alive. Everything hangs in a standstill in Ergastulum. As he lay on the grass, injured and bleeding, Warwick wonders what could have been if he had the same super physical strength as Nick. Thank you so much for watching. See you in the next video.